Hi, Dr. Staley. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Sound really good. Nice and clear. I had a quick question for you before we get started here. Awesome. Being, okay. being from Cornell. So a couple of years ago, we had uh, Nathan Oaks came out and did a presentation for us about his uh, lasers for my treatment in the beehives. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. I know there was talk about that, and it was, yeah, Nathan and Haley Schofield yes. um, had this, I think they called it the might zapper. Um, and I, I don't know. I believe Haley has left Cornell. I haven't seen her for quite a while. She was in our PhD program, but I think she decided to develop her, be, her night zapper business. So I, I'm afraid I'm in the dark on that. Shucks, I was hoping that we had some more information on that, but... Yeah, no, right. it, it, I, th I think it looked promising. Um, and because it was, uh, yeah, it was designed to be very sensitive. So that laser only went when the mite went past nothing and nothing else. <laughs> yeah, I, I talked to Nathan, well, I don't know. It's been a little while ago. I can't remember when it was, but he said that they had just done another test and they put it in an infected hive that was really infected. And uh, they went back like a week later and found they couldn't find a mite in the hive. Well, wow, so that's I was, wonderful. I was excited to see if you had any more insight on that. Randy looks like he got on. He might have. Randy looks like he got something to say. <laughs> had something to say about. No, that. I, yeah. I, just, I missed the question. I just tuned in. Oh, I Who asked him it? a couple of years ago. We had uh, a, re, a, a research team from Cornell came out and talked to us about a, a laser that they were working on to put in the hive for my treatment and oh wow yeah it's been pretty successful from what i understand and that, but i haven't heard anything for a little while so i wondered if dr seeley could update us on that but he doesn't know anything about it either so no they're, they're, oh, they got to be really careful when you when you pull a frame not to look down at the laser otherwise you, <laughs> you can't see anything anymore i think it's okay the, well dr seeley yeah. We're going to let you get started with your presentation now. Okay, I will go to, uh, let's see. So I need to share screen, doing that. Go to this, go to this, make it big. Okay, um, first of all, let's do a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Randy. Uh, uh, anybody else want to chime in and reinforce that it's not just Randy? Yeah. I can hear okay, you, Claire. Good. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Sounds good. Thank, thank, you. thank you. I turned up my mic today. Okay, good. Well, thank you for um, putting this, the, the um, putting Daniel uh, Schoenthal um, right before my talk and having me come right after his talk, because they go hand in hand. Uh, Daniel talked about going out and collecting swarms before they've chose, chosen a home. This talk is also about working with swarms, but it it's, it's makes it a little easier. You put out attractive homes for them so they move right in. So yeah, you still have to go out and collect the swarm, but you don't have to, you don't have to do the collecting. The bees have collected themselves into your hive, into your bait hive. Um, and uh, this is this is in fact how I get all of my bees these days. I put up bait hives, and I try to put them uh, in locations that are as as remote from beekeepers as I can find, because I'm trying to get locally adapted bees. So this is a way to get locally adapted bees as well. The essence of the process. Excuse me, Dr. Seeley, could you uh, either turn up the volume a little bit more on your mic or speak up because you you start getting very soft in the way you speak. <laughs> Okay, let me, let me just, Much better, thank I'll, you. Okay, what I will do is I will hold this mic right near my, um, close, close to my mouth. And uh, so if that works well, we'll do that. Okay, happy to. The essence of this talk is summarized in this first slide. The right bait hive is, uh, the right process of capturing swarms with bait hives is to have the right box in the right place at the right time. So that's what we're going to look at now. Here's the way we'll go through this, this material. I'll 
we'll start by looking at the natural homes of honeybees briefly again. And the reason we're doing that is because the natural homes of honeybees provide us with a good guide to what bees want in a home. Because when we find a wild colony, uh, they're, what they, what they're, where they're living is a place that they've chosen, and that can be a useful information for us. Um, I'll then review what I've learned about the real estate preferences, the home site preferences of honeybee swarms, because again, that builds on what we know about the natural homes, but you'll see, um, I checked carefully uh, with an experimental analysis of what the bees want. And I found things, some, some things that are important to them and some things that are not important. So it's good to know both of those sorts of things. That leads to a discussion of an effective bait hive design. And finally, the topic of, okay, now you've got your bait hive, how do you use it? How do you deploy it? How do you work with it? Again, going back to the topic of the natural homes of honeybees. Uh, as, as I explained yesterday, they're quite different from our, our hives, uh, man-made hives. They're high off the ground for one thing. Uh, they have uh, small entrances, uh, about a quarter of the size of the standard entrance, open entrance on a 10-frame Langstroth hive. And the cavity that they're living in is smaller than our hives, unless you keep your bees in just one deep 10-frame hive body. So there, that's what they're that's what a typical nest in nature is, the size of its nest. And I got interested in the natural nests of honeybees because I, I'm a biologist and I, wanted, I was curious to learn more about how honeybees live on their own in the wild. And I had studied the nests and I saw a lot of the features of their natural nests, which as we just mentioned, were different from the beekeeper's hives, my hives. And I wondered, well, which of those differences are there because the bees want them? Do they want little entrances? Do they want small nest cavities? Uh, do they want those entrances high off the ground? Um, so I was trying to figure out how to do a study of their real estate preferences. And uh, I was at the same time, I was reading about various things and I was reading about um, how beekeeping was done in Africa and I learned that beekeepers in Africa, they don't put their hives near the ground, they hang them up in log hives up in trees, as we see here on the right, and shown so nicely in this painting with the Maasai people. And, uh, and they just wait for the bees to come in. And um, I thought, oh, that's cool. I've never done that. In fact, I don't know of anybody that's ever that's done that. You have to understand, this is back in the late 60s, early 70s. And uh, so I said, I think I'll give this a try. And so I did a pilot experiment, and this was how I got um, going with my studies of the bees, experimental studies of what the bees seek in a home. I, I did a pilot experiment where I just, I took, made these green boxes, and, um, and they were about the size of a, what seemed like might be um, the size like I had seen in the, in the bee trees. And I gave them a small entrance and I put them high up. I, so I fulfilled with my, in my pilot experiment, I put up bait hives that matched what I had seen in the bee trees. And um, uh, my, my only qu my question here was, well, are there enough swarms around and can these compete with the tree cavities, these boxes? Can I actually um, capture swarms with these things? And what I found in the first summer, I put out six bait hives in the summer of 75 and, and three of them were occupied by swarms. So that 50% occupation, I thought, okay, that's good. I think, I think that tells me that I could actually do a study um, using these boxes, a study of what bees want in the home. So then what I did that winter, <laughs> came home for Christmas vacation, and I went out and got 70 sheets of 5 8 inch plywood, and I built myself 252 nest boxes. And you can see a, a picture of what it looked like in in my shop area where I was building these, lots and lots of those boxes. Now what this photo doesn't convey very accurately is the diversity of the boxes. The, there were, as we'll see shortly, I built boxes in, in different sizes. I built them with different size entrances. I built them in different shapes. I, I, built, a, uh, they, I built them with different shape entrances. We'll go through the variants on this. And that's why there's 252 nest boxes because when I wanted to test one variable, just say the height of the box, 
I need to put up two boxes, one low, one high, and I needed to put up about 12 pairs of boxes like that to, to help me um, to help me get enough occupations, enough uh, data to see whether the bees were showing a statistically significant preference for, for example, for a high box over a low box. I did, that was a project I, I did, put up lots of, of my boxes in the springs of spring of 1976 and 1977, and I caught 124 swarms in my various nest boxes. And I got a lot of data, so I'm going to share you with the results. But before we do the sh share you with the results, I'll explain again. I think I mentioned this yesterday. I would put out these boxes in pairs. And within a pair, the two boxes were identical, except for in one property, the volume, the entrance area, the entrance height, et cetera. And I would put the two boxes not really far apart. I'd put them like on these power line poles, which if I recall correctly, they were about 60 feet apart. And the reason I did that is I wanted to be sure that the scalp bees would find both boxes in a location. So they would actually have a choice. And that seemed to work well. Let's look at the one, vo uh, one, uh, one variable. You know, this will illustrate how the test works. Cavity volume. I, when I set up my experiment, I gave them three boxes to do, I put out uh, uh, boxes in trios, not pairs. And I put out three sizes. 10 liter, 40 liter, 100, 100 liter. And the reason I used those specific sizes because I had known, all, I knew already from the natural nests that there were very few uh, na natural nest cavities as small as 10 liters. There were a lot that were around 40 liters and there were very few as large as 100 liters. So I wondered, is this distribution because the bees actually like the 40 liter size and don't like the 10 liter size and don't like the 100 liter size? And remember, 40 liters is like one deep 10 frame hive body. So, okay, what did I find? I found, yes, indeed, they really, they, no, uh, they like the 40 liter box over the 10 liter and the 100 liter. N nobody moved into the 10 liter box and I got, I think, one occupation of the 100 liter box. And I got, I think in this experiment, I think I got eight occupations of the 40 liter boxes. So cavity volume preference, yes. What about cavity shape preference? Now, the, ch the choice I gave to the swarms was squat versus tall or cubicle versus tall, as you can see in the photo there. And the reason I thought they might prefer the tall one is because in my studies of the bee trees, that's what the nest cavities were always the shape of, um, consistent with the shape of a tree trunk. So put out squat versus tall. And again, everything about these two boxes is the same, the same color, the same wood, the same entrance area down here at the bottom, um, same wall thickness. They were put out at the same height same visibility, everything's the same except the shape. And did I find a preference? No, no preference. The bees did not prefer one over the other. So that was interesting. So they, they don't really care about the shapes, at least not the difference that I presented them with. What about entrance size? Do they have a preference for this? And the choice I gave them was between 2.5 square inches and 12.5 square inches. And again, that I knew to make that choice because I had seen in, the, in nature the nests in the bee trees. A 2.5 square inch entrance was a very common size for the entrance. 12, when you get out to something as large as 12 square, 12.5 square inches, that's exceptional. You don't, I just didn't see that in the bee trees. So I figured mm, maybe that's because they really like the smaller entrance. And indeed, that's what I found. No swarm ever moved into the cavity with such a large entrance. They all, and they would always choose the small entrance. Entrance size is pretty important to the bees, clearly. What about entrance shape? And here, uh, the two choices were an entrance that was a, a, a tall slot versus a, cir a circle, a hole, round hole. And I had seen in nature, I'd seen both sorts of entrances, things that were more or less circular openings. So they have a lot of, a lot of space for the op open area per perimeter. But I also saw a, a fair number of the natural nests had entrances that were cracks in trees or slits. 
And I thought, well, maybe they have a preference. I mean, a, an opening like this is, would probably be maybe better for airflow, uh, but it might be harder to guard. And so this one might be easier to guard, but maybe harder to organize an airflow. Um, so I thought, well, let's see what they prefer, if they have a preference. What did I find? No preference. No statistically significant uh, higher occupation of the slotted nest box versus the round hole nest box. Okay, so we're learning that these care about some things and not about others. Here, this was a fun one. What about draftiness? <laughs> and as you can see, I have made for this experiment, the two boxes were identical in all ways, except that one, I drilled lots of little quarter inch diameter holes on the front and the two sides. Whereas the other box was nice and nice and sound. It didn't, didn't have all those holes in it. And I thought for sure, I thought for sure that they would like a nice snug, windproof nest cavity over this this drafty old thing over here but what did i what did the bees what did the bees do no they showed no preference and now i now right now i wish we were together in the same room because i'd like to ask you why do you think the bees didn't care does anybody have any guesses about why the bees didn't care whether this whether the um my nest box had holes in the walls or not Plot questions? Yeah, that's exactly right. Who said that? <laughs> that you nailed it. They yeah, the, the swarm. Randy. Yeah. Okay, good for Randy. Um, I would have expected that, Randy. If you anyhow, <laughs> uh, what what the bees did is they moved in. When they moved into the box with all the holes, they just plugged them, plugged them all up with propolis, and that. Uh, so that was a good lesson for us and for me at least. It said that the bees. It showed that the bees are picky about things they can't fix. But if there's things they can fix, then they don't weight that very, very heavily at all, if at all. And uh, so they can't change much the, the volume of a cavity and they can't change the height of the entrance. So they're picky about that. But on draftiness, they can fix that. At least they could fix the box, the draftiness of the box I offered. And so they didn't care. That was fun. I learned a lesson. The bees were teaching me a lot. <laughs> Okay. That suggests uh, winter and winter ventilation for us too. The question yeah. about winter ventilation. Yeah, we could talk about winter ventilation if you'd like. Um, what I want to do now is just summarize the things that I learned with these all these nest boxes, these two hundred and fifty-two nest boxes. Um, what I learned about the bees' real estate preference and a in this coding here, a greater than b means a is preferred to b. So let's go through the nest site properties cavity volume, and if it's in blue, it means it matters to the bees. If it's in black, it means that bees don't care. Um, cavity volume, we explained that bees showed a clear preference. They avoided, the, they liked the middle size, not too small, not too big, kind of like Goldilocks preference, something in the middle. With respect to cavity shape, as we saw, they, I didn't find a preference. Tall was as attractive as squat, or squat was as attractive as tall, however you want to think of it. With respect to dryness, now I didn't explain how I did the dryness one, but in the dryness test, one of the boxes, well, both boxes had an inch of sawdust put in the bottom on the floor. And in one of them, every week I came along and I sprayed a quart of water into the box in through the entrance opening. And so in one, the, the bottom of the box was soggy and the other one, it was, it was dry. And as indicated here, the bees didn't care, um, probably because they can waterproof a nest. So they, uh, so leakage or wetness didn't seem to, was not uh, important to them. Other things were more important. So I guess when they can fix something, they don't they don't they don't worry about it. Uh, draftiness, uh, we've talked about that. Snug was as attractive as a drafty box, or drafty was as better, better put, drafty was as attractive as a snug box. Again, bees can fix that. They can caulk cracks and openings. Entrance area, on the other hand, they had a very strong preference. They like smallish entrances. That was very clear. And almost certainly that's for reasons of defense. And it probably also pertains to thermoregulation. We'll come, we'll come back to how they can deal with such a small entrance, even though they have ventilation problems in the summer on hot days. Uh, entrance height, very clear preference of, 
15 feet is preferred over a three feet high entrance. And that's probably, uh, in my experience, that's because the uh, uh, here where I live, there are black bears. And if, I, if a nest has its entrance near the ground, the bears are all over that entrance and they're trying to get into it. If it's a weak entrance, they'll break in. If it's high up the ground, the bears, which apparently don't have great eyesight and maybe don't have very good hearing and maybe, I, I don't know so much about the bears, but they don't find them. Don't find them up off the ground, except, well, I'll talk, that's another story. They, they did learn about my bait hives in the Arnott Forest, but I think that's because they were so conspicuous. A, a hive on a couple of boards up in a tree was pretty obvious to the bees, bears. Um, entrance shape didn't matter, as we saw. A circle and a slit had uh, same attractiveness to the bees. Entrance position. They very much preferred, very clear preference for the entrance at the bottom rather than the top of the cavity. And we can, we'll talk about that. It's almost certainly a matter of um, benefiting their thermoregulation. And it may also help with the hygiene. It means all the crud that comes to uh, dead bees or whatever just falls to the bottom and, and can be whisked uh, out of the hive. Entrance direction, it's very clear preference of a southerly entrance opening versus a northerly entrance opening. And I don't, I don't know if this will apply everywhere, but it's very clear that where I live in the winter, and I've done experiments where um, I have looked at this with hives facing north and south, they can do much better, make much more um, winter flights on sunny, warmish, sunny days if the entrance is bright and sunlit facing south. Last thing was combs in cavity. And this, for this, I would put the two boxes up and in one there would be some comb and the other would be empty without comb. And they really prefer those combs, cavities that had some comb in it. And that's probably for economy in their uh, comb building and nest construction. So we can see that there's one, two, three, four, six different things that, uh, that we know of that matter to the scout bees when they're um, evaluating a site as a prospective home. And this brings us to the question, what, what is an effective bait hive design? Now, I'm going to show you that the one that I'm showing you here is effective, but it's actually not going to be the high, bait hive design that I will advocate. But it does illustrate, it's what I used for many years before I figured out, oh, I can do this much easier, a different way. But, and, but this does is a good review to um, because it expresses what the bees want in a home. It's got, and you can see the dimensions here, it's about 14 inches, 15 inches on the outside, etc. And this gives us a, the right cavity volume, about 1.5 cubic feet. And you can see that, here's one nailed to a red pine here. So it's got the right volume, it has the right size entrance area, only about a one and a quarter inch diameter opening. And I put a nail across it to keep um, squirrels, red squirrels especially, it can be troublesome here, keep them out of it. Um, I put the entrance location near the floor of the hive, like the bees want, told me they want. I make the wood, uh, I just used 5 8 inch plywood because that was cheap, CDX plywood. And uh, I was concerned that the, there might be some glue uh, aroma coming off the plywood, but no, it, it's, it's perfectly fine for the bees, works well. And um, I paint the boxes dark green. And I, as the note indicates here, I do this to reduce vandalism. Uh, I started out making the boxes white, uh, thinking that that might make them less prone to being overheating in, in, if they're in the sun, full sun. Um, but I ran into a problem that in the hunting season, my, my uh, bait hives, my white bait hives, were, were, were wonderful targets for bored hunters. Uh, and so I'd, they'd, they'd end up with a lot of bullet holes in them. So I, I changed to green and that solved that problem perfectly. <laughs> Funny how that works, huh? So I, I use that last bait hive made out of plywood as an, to illustrate what is an effective bait hive. But here's a better bait hive. It's a more practical one, easier to use. And I just use an old hive body with some old combs put in it. And I'll fill the hive up with combs because I don't want the bees to move in and build a lot of um, crisscross 
new combs. So I, I put in a 10 old, 10 frames of old combs when I was doing it this way. Uh, the other things that I do is I reduce the entrance. You can see, if you can, I hope you can see this, it's a small opening. It's a, it's a fraction of the full opening of the, ten, of the standard hive arrangement. Um, I just put a block of wood to reduce the entrance size. And as you can see too, I put them up in the trees, uh, either using this sort of mount or at the time I, I was using this kind of mount. And this illustrates this hive here. <laughs> this is what this is what the, you may recall if you were watching yesterday. This is one of the bait hives in the, that I set up in the Arnott Forest. And this is how I put up my bait hives in the Arnott Forest. And they worked very well for for several years. I used this very successfully for several years, but then there must have been one really smart black bear that put two and two together or maybe uh, and figured out that that box up there is full of honey. Uh, and um, so it got to the point where I couldn't put the bait hives up. They would all get pulled down by, by black bears. Um, and they would usually, it would happen in the spring. I guess they're most hungry then. And uh, so that, I couldn't do that up. In the Arnott Forest, but you, I could do it in in other places where there aren't bears, and, and that's another way to do it, using old ten frame hive body um, with old combs. But that's not what I use either. Here's what I now use. <laughs> it's pretty. It's just a six frame hive, a nucleus hive, uh, and uh, I use these from. I had been using these for mating nukes. That's why I had them, and um, uh, I like these. Why do I like these? I like them because they're light and they're, they don't take as much equipment. And they're light because they're only six frames go inside them. They, um, the side walls are just quarter inch plywood. The end walls are, are uh, one inch, nominal one inch boards. Um, and I make the, the entrance I made quite small. So that's, that's what I'm offering them. It's, it's not 40 liters, but it's clearly above their acceptance threshold. Or it may be that if, if bees find a nest cavity that's got combs in it, they may, to the best of my knowledge, they don't even measure the volume of the cavity because somebody else has measured the volume of that cavity. Plus the combs get in the way of, of how the bees, the scout bees measure the size of the cavity. So I'm, get, I'm finding that this works really, really well, not only for the bees, but for me, because these, six frame nucleus hives are easy to move around. And you have to remember that once the bees move into these things, they can get, they can come in and pick up a lot of weight quickly. So you want something that's pretty, pretty light in itself so that once the bees come in and start uh, building a nest or putting their, putting honey in their combs there, um, uh, you'll still be able to move it easily. The other thing you'll, that's obvious in this photograph is I have not put this hive bait hive high off the ground. It's not as, as attractive as you put as if you if I had a shed or something like that. I just put it on a you can see on these old supers in an abandoned bee yard. Um, uh, but it works well enough. I, every year I get I get a swarm moves into this bait hive. And so uh, that's what I'm using. I tend to go lower now. Really I like to go like to put them on places where I can just walk up to them, don't have to have a ladder and just check them and walk away walk away with the bees if I need to, so if I've got some. Okay, so that's what, that's, we've gone through what, what I advocate for the use of bait hives, what it's worked well for me. Uh, what I want to do now is talk about the location. Where do you put these bait hives? And I've talked some about this, but let's go through it again. Um, as, I, in, as I know from my studies of what bees want in a home site, I know that getting them up high off the ground, 10, 10 plus feet up is ideal because I gave them a test and they they told me that they liked 15 liters much more than three uh, 15 feet much more than 15 than three feet off the ground um, so 10 plus feet is ideal but as I've just explained it I'm finding it's not necessary maybe ideal but not necessary you can still catch lots of swarms with the box lower down entrance direction well as, as I learned in this in my studies, facing south is better. So I, I do that. When I put out my bait hives, I make sure they face south. I like to make them, I like to have the entrances highly visible. And that's illustrated in this, in this 
image here. This, I, I chose this red oak tree to mount, to put up my mount for my beitive because it was open to this, uh, it, there was open ground to the south of that. So that entrance was, was easy for the scout bees to find. Now, why am I stressing visibility? It's because I've done a lot of studies out on it um, of what, how scout bees behave and what they're looking for and how they assess nest sites and things like that. And in all of those studies, which I do on an island off the coast of Maine, the first step of the investigation is to put out a swarm and to put out some boxes that are, that are giving uh, the options, the housing options for the, for the swarm bees. And usually I have to spend, a, usually I'm, I've got a couple of days where I'm sitting around at the, walking around the island, checking my boxes, checking the swarm. And I will see but on the island, scout bees going around and looking for things. And what do they do? What do I see them doing? Because there's a few old buildings on this island. What I'll see them doing is going up and down the walls of buildings. And wherever they see a little dark opening, they go in it. And that's what that said. So that's what they're looking for is little dark openings here and there. Sometimes I've seen them even go to a, where there was some repair work being done. I remember seeing them inspecting the, a sheet of plywood. They were going up and down the plywood. And whenever the scout bee came to a dark knot in the plywood, it, its attention was, it would rivet itself. Its attention was riveted to that dark place. Of course, it couldn't climb inside, but it was clear that it was very interested in that dark, dark spot. So I try to have my bait hives visible so that little scout bee, as she's going up, there was scout bees where you see them going up and down the tree. She's looking around for knot holes and bingo, she finds the, she finds your entrance of your hive easily. The last thing I want to mention about location is try to put your bait hives in well shaded locations. And I learned my lesson when I didn't pay attention to this. Uh, Back when I was doing my studies of the house hunting, the preferences, I put up bait hives and I didn't, I didn't always put them in shady places. For example, here was a test nest box, which was on the side of a tree. And it doesn't look really sunny now, but there was a time of day when that box was in full sun. And what happened was uh, the swarm moved into it, probably liked that site when it was shady and wasn't overheating, but then they moved in, they, they moved to that site but then it overheated maybe the same day or the next day. And what did they do? They moved out. And once they, and they were primed to build combs. So when they moved out, they started building comb on the outside and there they were stuck on the outside. Their nest was on the outside. They didn't use the interior of the box and they, and they were, they were goners. You know, a swarm can't survive like that. At least not where I live. So I, the, my solution to that is I try to put my bait hives in places that are shaded so that they don't, um, uh, because I know uh, if it's probably, if it's too hot, it will not be attractive to the bees. Uh, part four, how to use bait hives. So we've looked at what the design of the bait hive, where to locate it, what about using it? Um, First of all, do we put something inside? Yes, I use swarm lures. They're helpful, uh, not essential. Um, and you might wonder, why do you put a swarm lure in in addition to putting the combs in? I think it just makes the box more conspicuous to the scout bees. It's just one more way to help the scout bee find your box. And what, and when you think about it, what is a swarm lure? It's the Nazanoff gland secretion or a, artificial concoction of that, which is a come, and the message of that is come hither. And so it's a, it's, it's a way for the uh, scouts to, uh, in nature, this, when a scout bee finds a good site and she's inspected it, she will then stand at the entrance for a, maybe up to a couple of minutes, fanning, uh, scenting uh, to a, a prudence, present a, a signal for other bees to find what she has found. And so we reproduce that in big time with a swarm lure. And as I've mentioned, I also put in the bait hive frames of comb and that's helpful for attracting swarms. It makes it more attractive. And, and of course it makes it very easy uh, to transfer the bees to a, to a full size real hive um, when you, when you want to collect the bees, having them all on the comb it makes it easy to find the queen, etc. And um, you could put in some frames of foundation and maybe if you don't have drawn combs that that would be fine. Um, 
sometimes I do put in some frames of foundation in addition to a, a, some frames with drawn comb. Uh, I don't know if he could get whether it would work well to have the frames of foundation, but without any drawn comb, uh, if it might, it might, maybe, maybe it will work well because it will have some odor of beeswax if it's a beeswax foundation. I've not used the plastic foundation with swarms, but if there's combs in there, I think you could use the plastic foundation and it would work work well. Okay, another part about how to use bait hives. And let me check my time. How am I doing for time here? Okay. Uh, it's up till 1.50, so I've got another 15 minutes. Um, how to use bait hives? Inspecting. Uh, my tips here are my tips here are to check the bait hive frequently. And, and I check them, I like to check them about once a week. Um, and the reason is simple. It's a lot easier to collect or take down a bait hive if it's recently occupied. Um, sometimes I, I, I mess up I, and I find a bait hive occupied and it used to be when I had it high up and I was trying to climb down a ladder, it was, it was, and I was working off a ladder, it was not fun. So, um, and the way you can tell if a bait hive is occupied is not by seeing bees going in and out, because those just might be the scout bees, but if you see bees going in and out, carrying, uh, incoming bees carrying loads of pollen, then you know that it, this that box really is occupied. It's not just being scouted, it's being used as a home. Taking down a bait hive. Well, this is probably common sense, but let's just go through it for, for sake of completeness. Have your smoker lit before placing the ladder against a tree. And here I'm assuming that you're, uh, we're dealing with a bait hive that you've mounted on the side of a tree or some some on the uh, up on a roof or something like that. And the smoker lit before placing ladder against tree. Climb ladder, smoke entrance, staple screen over entrance. And I just use uh, standard eight mesh hardware cloth to break my screens for moving the bees. And then here, I don't climb down the ladder trying to hold the hive. I, I put up a rope, I loop it over over a limb or something above above the bait hive. I secure one end of the bait hive. Uh, I screw the bait hive with one end of the rope, and then I um, loop the other end around a limb, and then I let it drop down, and I tie it to the base of the ladder. Because I'm what I'm going to do now is I'm going to somehow whatever the secure, however I secured the hive, I'm going to loosen the hive, and I'm going to want to lower the hive with that rope. But I don't want the rope. I want the rope to be supporting, basically providing the support for the hive until I'm down on the ground. So at this point. I remove the nails and lower the bait hive to the ground. And um, then I take it to an apiary. And I do all this in, uh, I do this at a time of day when everybody's home. And that is a lot easier to do if you do it early, early in the morning. Because then the light, you're not losing light, you're gaining light as you, as you do your work. Um, you might leave a few bees behind because there are always some bees that, are, that go out almost at the even before dawn, um, they're going out and there's some activity. So you'll leave a few bees behind, but um, it's, it's a lot easier working in the morning when the light is low than when it, in the evening when it gets dark, really dark. So that's what I do. That's my advice on that. Uh, a few final considerations. Uh, one is that the swarms you catch are likely to consist of good, vigorous bees, and that's because weak colonies don't swarm. Um, and it's also tr true if you've put your bait hives up in places where there are, you can tap into the population of wild colonies, because those colonies, if they're living all on their own and they're they're getting strong enough to taking care of themselves well enough to make swarms those are those are bees that are well adapted to your location it's a i find getting these wild colonies is a good way to increase the genetic diversity of your bees if if, uh, if you had been previously getting your bees from a queen breeder queen producer i should say um in some place in a different part of the country for example where those bees might do really well in you know, wherever they're produced, but maybe not so well for your location. And I have to say, I've obtained beautiful bees with bait hives. Very rarely do I get a, a grumpy colony. They're, they're just nice, they're, they're really good bees. <laughs> and that's because the only the good, healthy 
healthy colonies are casting out swarms. I don't can't recall ever getting um, having uh, mean bees, but maybe I've just been lucky. With respect to capture success, it varies from year to year. It averages 50%, but some years I'll get almost 0%. If it's a if we've had a wet, cool spring and colonies didn't build up well out in the woods, and other years it's over 100%. So it's, it's, it varies. It depends on the strength of the swarming, the season of the, and so forth. Uh, so last consideration is just have fun. This is a, it, it really is, it's a fun way to, to um, uh, it's a way to have fun with honeybees. And I think the, you know, we, we talk about being beekeepers, but if you're, a, if you put up bay time, you can also say, I'm not just a beekeeper, I'm a bee trapper. <laughs> and if you go out and go hunting for wild colonies, then you can be a, a bee hunter as well. So I think the complete bee, bee nut is a beekeeper, a bee trapper, and bee hunter. So this talks a about being a bee trapper. And I bet a lot of you are already are doing this. Um, so I, I, but maybe I hope this talk has been useful to you, even if you've already been doing it. So I think we're at the point where uh, we got some time. I don't want to go over time, but I think we've got time for questions. And I'm happy to take some. Hey, Tom, on those yeah. uh, hives that you had the perforations in, yes, right um, did you leave the um, bees in there long enough to see whether they filled all the holes or did they ever close up, leave any of the upper holes open for ventilation? No, they, they, that was, that was a real, thank you for asking that question, Randy. Um, no, they filled all those holes. <laughs> and uh, so they, and we could talk about that, but uh, it's, a, it's rats, it's another talk, but we're, we're finding that if we, uh, if we remove the top entrance and have a well insulated hive, there's, they don't, um, they don't have condensation above them because the, the cold area in the hive is, the area of the hive that is cool enough for condensation is below the cluster. So I think that's what they're doing in nature as well. They're in these well insulated cavities with no top entrance and they're snug and warm up in the top of that, in this top area of their hive. And the last thing they want is a hole in the top where the heat goes out. Mm -hmm. But thanks for that question. <laughs> yeah, it's always, I, I love the approaches because what you were thinking is, what do the bees tell us? <laughs> what, what do we learn? Exactly. What they do. <laughs> Listen to the bees. That's it. I agree. Hey, Dr. Seeley, uh, do you see the question and answer section or? Oh, I, I, what do I, oh, now I do. I'll do the Q&A. Yep, very good. Okay, I'll start from the top. Thank you for the prompt. Are there any laws about putting a bait hive in a forest? For example, property that is forest service. Very good question. Um, yeah, you have to get permission. You can't just plop your high, your bait hives around willy nilly. So um, yeah, that's and uh, if it's forest service, uh, that's a good question. I don't have forest service around here. Uh, we do have state parks, and I I don't they don't want me to put them in in the state parks um, just because they don't want they don't want I guess they don't want people bumping into bees or having bee colonies conspicuous. Next question, what is the best height for a bait box? Well, the bees have told us, have told me that higher is better, but I, but that's what's best for the bees, but you have to be considered your own needs as well. And so I, I advocate putting them only at a modest high, not at ground level, don't put them at ground level, but put them up a meter or so. Uh, what, or if you have a porch or something like that, where you can easily get to them, at the, that you can, but you don't have them high off the ground, um, that works well too. So best is a matter of what's, what's acceptable to the bees, but also is safe for the beekeeper. Next question. If bees will modify their immediate environment to fit their needs, and they prefer smaller hive box opening, why do you think we don't see bees plugging up with propolis normal full length Hive box openings to a 2.5 square inch size. Well, occasionally I do see that. It's a good question, and I, I don't have a good answer for that. But interestingly, I'd say uh, in the colonies I manage, I see them at least where I live in the fall. If I don't if I don't reduce the entrance down, and I usually do reduce the entrance down, they even the, re the re reduced entrance they will be many of the hives will be building a propolis wall to close off the 
close off most of the entrance. In the extreme, they'll close off the entrance opening down to openings that will admit just one or two bees. So sometimes some of the hives, um, and, I'm, and again, I'm getting bees out of the wild. Some of these colonies do this. It might be that that's something that the queen producers have bred out of their bees as they select for bees that don't like to put, don't use much propolis in their hives. It would be an interesting thing to study. To, uh, I should do, I'll have to do a good, do a real study on that. Compare the local bees versus bees from, a, say, from Hawaii, where they don't probably need propolis uh, to close off entrances. Propolis is so sticky. Can the bees break that down and use it again somewhere else? Um, you know, I don't have, a, I don't know for sure, but my hunch is that it gets difficult for them. When the, when the propolis is fresh, when it's freshly collected from the buds of a tree, it's pretty, it is sticky and malleable then, but when it, when it, it eventually, as we all know, it hardens. And I think it, and the, once it's hardened, I think it's, it's, it's not manipulable by them. How do bees prefer east-west versus south-facing bait hives? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, haven't, haven't studied that. I just gave them the north-south choice. Um, not sure. How do you keep, oh, here's a good question too. How do you keep wasps out of bait hives? Uh, it's difficult. We have one introduced species of yellow jacket, the German yellow jacket, and it is a cavity nester. And it uh, when it first came in, its populations got high, and, uh, and some of my bait hives were occupied by yellow jackets, which was no fun. But for whatever reason, that, that wasp didn't take very well, and we don't see that problem now. So, but where you are, I, I don't know what your situation is. But yes, some yellow, one, at least a few species of yellow jacket wasps are cavity nesters, and they can move in. Most of them, in my experience where we have them, they're ground nesting. But the uh, German yellow jacket was a tree cavity nester. How far, oh, thank you, Fred Hoskins, for asking this question. I always forget to explain this. How far away from apiary is a good location? Really important. You need, in my experience, Fred, I will not get bees, I will not get a bait hive occupied if I put it within 100 yards of an apiary. I always put, I, for many years, I put one near my apiaries thinking, well, okay, if a swarm comes out and I don't see it, it'll move into my bait hive. I never caught it be a swarm in my apiary, but I started putting my bait hives uh, uh, at least two or 300 yards away, and then I would catch swarms. Now, I can't be sure they came from my hives, but the fact is I never got any when I put a bait hive near my apiary, and I think it's because swarms like to disperse. I think they look, they, when they go searching for a new home, they go searching some distance from their old home. Next question. Can you clarify the optimal entrance size? Dr. Google, Dr. Google, oh, what does he know? Dr. Google is telling me that 2.5 square inches from the preference slide is about a 0 0.9 circular hole. The 1.25 hole on the three effective bait hive design slide is 4.9 square inches. So is there a preference of 0 0.9? I'll have to go, wait, I got my calculator here. <laughs> Again, let's make sure we're talking about diameters or radii. Okay, a 1.25 hole. Let me just check, turn the calculator on. So that's a 0 0.625, 0 0.625 times 0.625 times pi times 3.14. Uh, yeah, I think you. I think there's a confusion here about diameter versus radius. I get the area of a 1.25 diameter hole is one is about one and a quarter square inches. So yeah, that, that's the difference between, yeah. One, so that just make note that that hole size uh, um, uh, is uh, about a one inch diameter, a one and a quarter inch hole will, be, will work well. It's because its area is about, yeah, is is a uh, is a good size. Yep. Let's see. Uh, do you ever put frames with honey in it? Uh, no, I don't put frames with honey in my bait hives. Um, the reason for that, and I appreciate that, again the question. Um, I have observed that if I put frames with honey in it, it's it's apt to attract ants. 
and bees do not like ants in a prospective home. Next question. Do the bees have a preference for wall thickness? I don't know, and it's, uh, it is something I am checking this summer. I, uh, I, I, I went, I just have never tested that. So I'm going to be putting up bait hives, pairs of bait hives and one in which the bait hive is made with a, um, just a one inch, I'll use nuke boxes. So they just have one inch nominal lumber for the walls. And the other one, the other, the other bait hive in each pair will have two inches of foam on the walls added to that. And we'll see whether the bees show a preference. Do you ever suggest collecting at night, possibly with a headlamp? Um, I don't suggest collecting at night because at night, if the bees don't have light and they come out, they start crawling around and they're, they're not flying at you. They're crawling up on your clothes and stuff. It's pretty, it's, I find it awkward. So I, and I like to work, I like to have, a, I'd rather have a low daylight rather than work with a headlamp. But if you have to, you could, you could make that work, I'm sure. But it's a little, yeah, it's a little, at least I find that harder. Do bees go back to their hive if they leave the swarm hive? Do they just die? Oh, now there's a, that, man, thank you, Rhonda. That's a question of compassion. What happens if you take away the bait hive and you've got, you've stranded some bees? What happens to those poor bees? I don't know. I, bees are pretty smart. I bet they can figure out, I can bet they remember where their old home is. And so I like to think they can go home, find their way home. Um, how are we doing for time? So I'll, I'll let the organizers tell me when to stop chatting away here. Next question. Do you worry? Do you, okay. Carry on, Dr. Seeley. Carry on. I shall. Thank you. Do you worry about catching a colony that has absconded due to foul brew disease, parasitic mite syndrome, et cetera? Um, no, I don't. I, I, I don't. Uh, foul brood is very rare in where I am, but I suppose in places where there might be a lot of foul brood, you would, you would need, you would be checking your, your, your swarms to see, uh, to checking the colonies established by your swarms to see if they do come in with foul brood. Parasitic mite syndrome, um, again, I, I, I'm not seeing that. Uh, the mite levels are, are low in these swarms that, are, that I'm collecting, and uh, so I'm just, I'm, I'm not seeing that, thankfully. Should you put the new hive somewhere socially distanced for a while? Well, yes and no. Socially distanced in the sense that you need to move that hive at least a few miles from where the bait hive, where the swarm moved in. Otherwise, this, you'll, you'll lose the foragers. They'll go back to the, where the bait hive was. Um, in terms of socially distanced from your other hives, I, I don't. I just bring it to my apiary. Um, and again, it's... Um, and. And I, have, I don't treat for mites because I find that they come in with very few mites. But that, that may be peculiar to my situation where I'm trapping mostly from wild, unmanaged colonies, which seem to know pretty well how to deal with mites all on their own. If, if I were not in that situation, yeah, I would check, I would check for mites and treat accordingly. That's, that, that's, a, good, that's a good point. Rick Housley, since bees seem to prefer a higher entrance, do you think that because we, as beekeepers, with our hives low to the ground, contribute to the propensity to swarm? Um, I don't think, Rick, that our hives being closer to ground level increases the propensity to swarm. I think it just, I think that height thing is mostly, a, is the reason they like the height is because it gives them safety from predators like black bears and ants and things like that. So I, I, I don't think it affects their swarming tendency, unless in some way colonies build up a little better if they're up off the damp ground and a little higher in sunnier spot. But I'd say generally the answer would be no for that question. Question, talk about scout bees again. Are they born that way? How do you know they have smarter brains? Okay, Becky. Um, yeah, I talked, I'm talked about this in passing yesterday. What we do, what we find, Becky, is that we, if we create a, if we have a swarm and we collect bees that are performing waggle dances for nest sites on the swarm, and thus they are, we know they're scout bees, and we collect them and we drop them in liquid nitrogen to quickly freeze them, 
And at the same time, we collect other bees that are not active on the swarm. They're not doing dances. So these are non-scout bees. And then what we do is we, uh, and we can look at the patterns of gene activity in their brains. And in particular, we tend to focus on the genes that are involved in learning. And what we find is that the scout bees are in a physiological state that the activity of the genes that are important for learning are upregulated. So these bees have their brains tuned up for doing lots of learning. And I don't know, I don't, that doesn't mean that these bees are genetically different. They're inherently smarter because we know that when bees go through different stages of their life, they turn up and turn down different parts of their physiology. What, a middle-aged bee that's involved in comb building, of, of course, activates genes that are involved in wax synthesis. Scout bees have their genes activated that are involved in learning because they have to lot of, do a lot of learning. Um, so let's see, I had a passing thought there. What was that? So no, I don't think that these scout bees are genetically distinct from the other bees, but their pattern of gene activity is distinct from the non-scout bees. I hope that answers the question. So I don't think they're born that way. I think that's it. That is, uh, that is like um, that they've they've adjusted to their function as a scout bee, just as a comb builder bee adjusts her physiology to be a, a comb builder bee by activating her wax glands. You have problems with wax moth in bait hives. Uh, no, I don't. In fact, I have almost no problems with wax moth. I haven't seen wax moths in years. The only, the, the only place I have wax moth problems or have had wax moth problems is in, sto in my storage building where I used to have to be careful about um, uh, uh, keeping the moths out of the stored equipment. But in the bait hives, I think it's because they're so widely dispersed. I think they're hard for the wax moths to find. And I think that when we, you know, put a make put a shed full of full of combs in, in a building, we've, we've made a gold mine for the wax moths. And maybe they can orient. It's a very maybe a very strong signal for them to find those combs. But I don't have that problem in bait hives. I, I at least I haven't so far. Do you include wind as a variable in your studies of home selection? I don't, but it doesn't mean it's not important. It might be that these bees are, who are so, so, so well adapted and so um, alert, they may be assessing something like the exposure. Uh, uh, maybe a more sheltered site is in fact more, is assessed by the scalp bees, but I don't know. Thank you for that question. You can see there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot we know and there's a lot we don't know. So uh, I very much appreciate your questions. Okay, Dr. Seeley, thank you for your time and all your question and answers you, you did for us. Um, I like thank to you for, one for inviting me. To everybody, um, when you're out trapping for bees, uh -huh. um, be careful in Utah. We do have <laughs> African hive bees here. So if you go out and catch or ca capture an African hive hive out in the wild, now you bring it to your yard you just brought some bad genes to your yard and they can get very mean and you can spread those genes throughout your yard. So be very careful in doing that here in Utah. So is, uh, the, is the main concern about getting bees that are really defensive? What's that? Yeah, it, it's getting uh, Africanized colonies. Ah, yeah. okay. They, they've yeah, moved into don't... Utah and they are moving. They're in Southern Utah now and there are different waterways that are following that we've seen with recent maps. Um, Interesting. Migration of honeybees into California and back to Utah can carry, you know, those. Oh, yes, those I see. Can come in. So when you are yeah. capturing swarms and baiting for hives out in the wild, you need to be very careful in doing that. Okay. So and, do I understand correctly that these are Africanized colonies that have been are getting transported into Utah, or are these colonies that are endemic now? These are, they're already here, Dr. Both. Seeley. Yeah, they might both. be a little of both, but a lot of them are here already. Oh, gosh, what kind of winters do you have? Do you, I mean, are they able to survive your winters? Because that's what kills them off up here. Well, Dr. Seeley, 
uh, hardiness zones in Utah goes from uh, 4A all the way down to 9B in southern Utah. So we have the oh, death got it. is in southern Utah where that, that's where we're having the problems now. I but understand. we're almost seeing that in some of those coder regions that those afternoon bees are um, surviving. They're adapting and yeah. surviving and they are moving. So that's just yeah. one, one warning I want to give to all our viewers is to be careful when you're doing this. Know what yeah. you're getting. Um, a lot of times those afternized bees will not be aggressive when you catch them. It may take six months before they decide that this is their home. And afternized bees will swarm quicker than a regular European honeybee. So yeah. just just be cautious in what you do and and be safe. So thank you, Dr. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're we are welcome. now going to go into 